Ja, dann darf ich als Erste das Wort ergreifen und mich ganz äh, Sie herzlich begrüßen heute zu einem Talk zwischen äh, Jean-Jacques Lebel und Heinz Norbert Jox. Ich begrüße Sie sehr herzlich. Welcome in Düsseldorf, Jean-Jacques Lebel. It's a big, huge honor for us that you came here. Thank you. Um, and um, yeah, I'm very also very grateful to Heinz Norbert for having brought up the idea der Jean-Jacques Lebel eingeladen hat in unserer Reihe, unserer lockeren, aber jetzt sich immer mehr intensivierenden Reihe äh, zum Museum Global, äh, diesen Talk mit beizusteuern. Jean-Jacques Lebel darf ich ganz kurz äh, vorstellen. Ein Künstler, der aber auch Übersetzer ist, Philosoph, Lyriker, der ähm, eine ganz, einen ganz eigenen Ansatz sehr früh in die äh, Happening-Szene der, der frühen 60 verwickelt war, eng mit der Beat Generation zusammen war, ein Mann der Revolte, wie es so äh, schön heißt und der, und das leitet dann vielleicht auch schon zu diesem Thema äh, Globalisierung hin, der ähm, äh, als Kind französischer Eltern, als Kind von Künstlereltern äh, in New York aufgewachsen ist, in Paris geboren 1936, aber dann in New York aufgewachsen, dann wieder zurückgekommen nach, nach Paris und dann jetzt eigentlich so auf dem ganzen Erdball arbeitet und, und viel unterwegs ist. 2009 gab es eine ganz große Ausstellung im ZKM und wie Jean-Jacques Lebel gerade erzählt hat, auch in Düsseldorf hat er etliche Ausstellungen gehabt und kennt viele äh, Protagonisten hier äh, aus der Stadt. Einige sind ja auch da, einige Künstler, was sehr, sehr schön ist. Ähm, ja, das erstmal so zum einen zur Einführung habe ich, wenn ich was Großartiges vergessen habe, kannst du vielleicht noch Details hinterherfügen. Also es ist eine ganz eine reichhaltige Biografie, die enge Verbindung zu äh, Guattari und Deleuze könnte man erwähnen, aber auch eben die Übersetzungen von William S. Burroughs. Also da will ich jetzt gar nicht so ins ganz ins Einzelne gehen. Heinz Norbert Jox muss ich vielleicht gar nicht mehr groß vorstellen. Wir sind seit lange mit ihm verbunden. Er als Publizist, Autor, Herausgeber vieler Kunst. Forums, Bände und andere Bücher, Schriftsteller, Kunstschriftsteller, der hier ähm, mit uns im Schmiedehaus zuerst diese große, lange Reihe Heilige Macht der Sammler ähm, veranstaltet hat und jetzt immer wieder mit sehr, sehr guten Ideen, sehr ausgesuchten, sehr interessanten Vorschlägen ankommt. Das wird uns noch ein paar Mal auch dieses Jahr, äh, werden wir in den Genuss kommen, zum Beispiel mit Sarah Thornton auch zu sprechen oder mit Ihnen mit Sarah Thornton sprechen zu hören. Und insofern bin ich jetzt erst mal sehr gespannt auf euren Talk, der auf Englisch sein wird. Dankeschön. Erstmal einen guten Abend. Ich spreche ein bisschen jetzt erstmal Deutsch. Kurz. It's allowed to speak a little bit German. Okay. Um, I'm sorry I can't speak German. Entschuldigung. Uh, I feel very bad to speak in English. I should be speaking to you in your tongue. Uh, here in Dusseldorf, I'm very glad to be back in Dusseldorf. We have many very good old friends, and, and I've worked here often. And um, I'm sorry, we'll be speaking in English, and I hope you don't um, perceive that as cultural imperialism, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that problem. Um, I just do my best to speak in a language which... Uh, is neither yours nor mine, but we'll, we'll, we'll try and manage, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you f first for your coming. I'm very happy about it. Uh, Thank you for from inviting me, <laughs> you know, back. Now we make a lot of compliments. Uh, I speak a little bit German. Uh, ich habe Jean-Jacques Lebel eingeladen, uh, or I tried it in English. I have invited him uh, to this talk because we met us uh, very often in Paris and we have spoken very often about his work as an artist who is working in collectives. And so I realized that he was always working together with other artists from other cultures. And therefore I have this idea, perhaps it's possible to find another idea about globalization. And so uh, it was my idea and we have spoken about it and I realized it would be uh, possible. And so I have invited you. And it's a kind of, I, I will start in a way, we have heard you speaking English. Mm -hmm. And for a French guy, it's a perfect English. 
without French uh, in, uh, with fra French uh, 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 accent. And uh, so I will start uh, to, to speak a little bit about your time in New York. You mm -hmm. were grown up in New York as a child. And my first thought was perhaps with another connection to other cultures. Because you are born in France, but you grew up in uh, New York, and you came back to uh, Paris. C can you speak a little bit about your time uh, in New York in relationship to your later idea of globalization or uh, other cultures? Well, people are always asking me and everybody else, where do you come from, you know? Where you, in America, the first thing that if you meet somebody on the street or in a bus or a plane, they say, where are you from? You know that, you've heard that millions of times. As if you were defined by the place you were born. I think that's wrong. I think human beings, all of us, we are defined by what we make of, out of our lives. We are not defined really by where we were born or who our parents were. Although there's this pseudo-Freudian myth that we are simply the result of what our parents were. I'm a, of, of a completely different opinion. Uh, the names of Deleuze and Guattari were mentioned earlier. And um, I'm sure you have read the famous books by Deleuze and Guattari, uh, <coughs> including the first important one, L'Anti-Oedipe, which explains in very precise political terms that our lives are something to be sculpted by ourselves and uh, it, nothing is given at birth. And um, so I have problems to answer that question, which is always asked, what country do you come from? And I remember always this wonderful answer by Jonas Makas, this extraordinary inventor of underground cinema, with whom I is an old friend of mine, and with whom I had the honor of showing last year at the ZKM in Karlsruhe. Uh, Jonas was born in Lithuania, and he, with his little brother, walked across Europe by foot, and. Uh, uh, to escape Nazism, and uh, arrived just when the in in Germany, just when the war was ending, and he was put in a displaced persons camp here in Germany for a year and a half, and after a while made his way to Brooklyn, near Manhattan in New York, and. People are always asking Jonas, are you Lithuanian or are you American? Are you, what are you? And he says, neither. He says, my country is cinema. And I think that's a brilliant answer. And um, I feel very much to, uh, that we should maybe develop that a little bit, that in this horrible times of return of nationalism. I'm sure you read the papers and you are aware of what's going on in the world. All these disasters that are happening with the um, fundamentalist religions and the ultra-nationalists in Europe, including in Europe, everywhere, that maybe a good answer would be that my country is poetry, my country is art, my country is philosophy, my country is music. It has nothing to do with geographical boundaries. It has to do maybe with language. We speak, all of us, many languages. And in other words, I, tr Norbert, I'm trying to approach the problem of the origin as something uh, that has more to do with the future than the past. Well, New York, when I was a kid, of course, was absolute paradise compared to uh, the schools in Europe, you know. Um, the American kindergarten system 
which I think was would be interesting to talk about for a few minutes, um, was benefited from the European exile, especially the uh, Viennese psychoanalysts who arrived uh, in the United States in the 30s. And uh, they influenced very much the way that children were taught in schools. And one of the innovations, which was very important, was called finger painting. In other words, that little kids, two, three, four, five years old, boys and girls, of course, would be allowed to play with paint directly, not with brushes, but directly. Of course, if you know the Freudian theory of uh, uh, concerning the playing with one's feces, you understand how this com completely new way of allowing children to grow from one stage to another with color and getting all covered with paint all over the place and putting paint on the wall, paint on your hair, painting everywhere. It's, it, I think that that had an enormous influence on American art. And I have a, a, an intuition that perhaps that was the real beginning of action painting, which, of course, the generation that was taught this in kindergarten in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, be, when the artists became adult, they continued this way of uh, using their body as the, as the canvas. And um, definitely, um, New York in those days was a sort of paradise. Um, and I see my old friend Conrad Klapek, who uh, uh, make us uh, the honor of coming here. We, when Conrad and I meet, we always talk about jazz. And you know, uh, in those uh, the f 40s and 50s was the time of the uh, the golden years of bebop. You know, of Charlie Parker and and Thelonious Monk and Dizzy Gillespie. And um, when I was a little kid, I was very much influenced by that. And um, uh, the fact that uh, there were two societies, the black society in Harlem and the white society all over the place. And I was very much fascinated and interested in the black society, the black point of view. And of course, that changed a lot of things in my life. I don't want to go into too much detail, but uh, definitely I would say that those years, um, which widened my outlook on life, were definitely very important, yes. Let us speak a little bit about more about your relationship to the black culture. Because yeah. you are grown up in New York, yeah. and an old black woman was responsible for you yeah. when you grew up, and it was, and perhaps you can speak a little bit about the story in, uh, that you uh, went to refer to Harlem. Harlem. Yeah. A and another question, because we want to talk about the question of globalization. Uh, you were confronted in New York with different cultures in Paris too, Chinese people, people from South America, and so on. And you are, have spoken about what there are no boundaries. But in which other way we have to understand the coming together of different cultures in a place like New York or Paris or everywhere? Well, I'm sure that anybody who's been to New York is uh, perfectly aware of the fact that um, there's little Italy, little China, little Ukraine. In Brooklyn, you have little Russia. Uh, you know, a uh, little Germany, a uh, little Poland, uh, and all these things, they, all these different languages and cultures, they're always struggling for the space, you know? Like, uh, uh, you know, Chinatown um, s stops at the Bowery, and the Bowery is where all my beatnik friends lived. And, uh, or in San Francisco, it's the same thing. We, you know, where little Italy and China, they're always uh, fighting for the space there is there. And of course, when you fight for space, you, you mix. You, 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 you have a tendency to, there's no such thing as purity. Everybody is, is um, you know, exchange in, in complete daily exchange. Um, it, not only in school when you're a kid, or in the streets, but in adult life also. And um, 
Yeah, uh, when I was uh, six years old, I had um, um, uh, what we call in English a nanny. A nanny is a, a, a lady who takes care of children. And she was a, a black lady, and she was very, very old. In those days, she was at least 80 years old. And her mother had been a slave, Her, you know, in, in the 1850s. And um, she, she had a secret. And um, she took me to Harlem and taught me that secret. And the secret was that um, on Sunday mornings, uh, they would meet in, in, in these churches in, in Harlem. They were um, sort of Protestant sects, uh, you know, um, not really official churches, but uh, there were black African churches. And uh, they would sing the gospel, which is the origin of jazz, as you know. And they would sing in choirs. And uh, after a while, they would start get falling into trances. And so here are these ladies who were obviously not very rich, who were probably working as manual laborers, but who had these fantastically beautiful dresses and hats that they made themselves, like a carnival, if you wish, but it was every Sunday. And uh, they would sing, they would sing. I'm not going to imitate them here because it would be sacrilegious, but they would sing. And after a while, they would fall into a trance. And they would fall on the floor and they would go into these extraordinary um, moments in which they came out of themselves and went into a sort of mystical state of trance where they were singing, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, you know, and rhythmically. And they would sort of foam at the mouth and, and became, become somebody else. And if you study um, anthropology and um, these secret societies in, in black Africa. Uh, this is, was the origin of that, of course, uh, where um, you are one person in everyday life, and then you enter into a sort of trance and you become somebody else. In other words, you accept schizophrenia as a fact of life, that you are not one person, but you are many people, not only two, maybe three, four, and that all of us are many people. Each one of us, whether we are artists or not artists, it doesn't matter, we all are several people, each one of us. And um, that was the lesson. That was the lesson uh, that I learned when I was a little kid in Harlem. And of course, that was a lesson that continued in jazz because finally, you know, that's what the jazz music music is all about. Um, and um, you want to continue this conversation, or should I continue? No, you cannot. I could go on for five you, you, hours you like can, this, you know? No, 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 perhaps we make a break. Uh, if, you t if you take a word like schizophrenia in your mouth, yeah. it's very easy for me to, to come uh, to your friendship with Deleuze and Guattari. Yeah. And it was so that you brought uh, Deleuze and Guattari t to New York, yeah. and you make the friendship between, uh, what, what is the beatnik writers, Burroughs? and uh, some other uh, writers and my feeling was but you but you have influenced Deleuze and Guattari and on the other side they have influenced you in your thinking and when you are speaking about boundaries there are no boundaries in which way you would use the thinking of Deleuze and Guattari in order to speak another way about uh, cultural differences um. I wouldn't dare use the word influence, Norbert. Um, let's say that important friendships are always uh, in a state of exchange. You're, you're taking and you're giving all the time. Um, it's, it's a question of a process that never stops. And um, these two very important thinkers who whose works have been translated into German. I su suppose that you, everybody here is familiar with them. Um, were directly connected to the artistic movements of their time, of our time. 
and also extremely directly connected to the political movements and um, to the, to the, the uh, pre-May 68 movements and during May 68. Uh, it's no secret that uh, for many of us, uh, I say us, plural, um, that was probably the most important experience of our lives in which, um, um, you know, uh, in, in the art world and in the world of culture, um, it, it, either you accept the rule of the market, of the mainstream market, uh, um, and then you b make a sort of bureaucratic career with commercial success, or you refuse that law of capitalism, uh, either because you refuse it deliberately or just because you cannot obey it, that law. And in that case, you are rejected by society and uh, uh, you hear all your life that you're crazy. You're told that you're crazy. You cannot adapt to the existing institutions, the, existed, the dominant uh, ideology of, of the time, in other words, the market. And uh, uh, sometimes it's, there's, a, there's a big danger of, um, that each one of us has uh, is that to, to, to wonder if maybe you are a little bit crazy, you know? And, and there's, there's this problem of being unadapted to the cultural and social and economic environment. And so um, all of a sudden, uh, when a mass movement, a mass pre-revolutionary movement, such as the May 68 movement occurred, um, of course, we knew, we felt in the air many years before that something was going to happen. We didn't know when or where, of course, but we felt that something was going to explode. Uh, here in, in Germany also, I remember going to a mass demonstration in Berlin in, in, in 67, one year before, and there were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of Berlin, and we, we, it was obvious that something was going to happen, you know? But we didn't know what the name was or where it was going, but we just felt the energy and the obvious direction in which the entire society was going. And all, all of a sudden, you turn around and you see two or three hundred thousand people that are like you, you know? So you, you don't feel alone and crazy anymore. You feel that what you were told was crazy was in fact not crazy at all. And that this um, way of perceiving a different kind of reality, a different kind of culture, not only a different kind of painting or a different kind of music, but a different way of living, of experience everyday life. It's something that uh, my friends Deleuze and Guattari were extremely keen on um, uh, being part of. And um, I wanted to tell you that this concept, that's why I, uh, th this thing is on the, on, just on the wall here behind Norbert, is that one of the key concepts that they coined um, was agencement collectif d'énonciation. I will not try and translate that into English. It's very delicate, but I'm sure that Norbert will try and give you the meaning of that. Agencement collectif d'énonciation. And that's something that comes from Deleuze and Guattari. And where did they get that notion? They got it from the social movement. It didn't come out of thin air. It came out of their experience of the new culture, the new relationships between the human beings in this mass movement, of course, not only in France, all over the world, in Japan, in Germany, in Italy, uh, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, I mean, all over the place. Not absolutely everywhere, but in many, 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 many different places. And what is l'agencement collectif d'énonciation? Let me say that, uh, try and, and, and say a few words about that, because it's a key notion. 
it's a new way or a different way of making art. It uh, considers that the author of the art, of the book, of the music, or whatever, is not one individual. It's a set of relationships between individuals. In other words, it's a collective way of producing art. Um, let me give you a very precise example. Um, one of the great innovators of our time, who is still alive, a wonderful, wonderful genius, called Ornette Coleman, he invented a thing called free jazz. And um, in the early 60s, he made a record called Free Jazz. You may have seen it or listened to it. And on the cover is a wonderful painting called White Light by Jackson Pollock. And um, I won't go into the details of why Free Jazz is fundamentally important, but f as far as I'm concerned, I feel it is one of the great innovations of our time. And in the notes, of the album, Ornette Coleman writes these words. He says, we were all improv improvising with such freedom, listening to each other, that we didn't know any longer who was playing what. In other words, the structure of the jazz piece before free jazz and the time of swing and bebop was that the orchestra played a theme, then each soloist, uh, trumpeter, saxophone, piano, etc., would take a solo, and then they would play together again for the coda, and at the end they would play the theme once again. And that was it. So the, all the the, 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 the richness of the improvisation of each artist was within his or her solo. Whereas in free jazz, everything was changed. Everybody was playing at the same time, listening to what others were doing and answering immediately in a sort of question and answer situation. That was free jazz. And uh, I think that is a good uh, example of what Agencement Collectif Denunciation was. J just, just one more phrase. But if Deleuze and Guattari coined the phrase, coined the concept, they didn't invent the practice. So who invented the practice? These guys. Behind Norbert, you have what is called a cadavric ski. A cadavric ski is probably one of the most extraordinarily important innovations by the Surrealists. Maybe you're not aware of the importance of the cadavric ski because in museums and in art history, um, it, it's been a little bit forgotten. And there's a reason for that. It's because, you know, history is made by the market. And uh, the cadavre ski are always drawings, more or less this size, not very big. They are collective, they are not signed, and they are commercially not very saleable. So they've been forgotten. But in fact, it's one of the most important inventions of the Surrealist movement. This is the first known cadavre ski. It was drawn in 1926 by Yves Tanguy and André Masson, this one on the wall here. And um, it's a game. It's called in French, le jeu du cadavric ski, the game of the cadavric ski. In other words, it was a, a, a game activity, but it was an extremely experimental and, 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 and very radical game, but still a game. That's why probably it wasn't taken seriously enough by the historians. Can I interrupt you? Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> before I come back, to, I uh, before I come, I w would like to bring you back to the question of cultural difference. Yeah. I would say something in between, but in German, because 
Mhm. Wegen meiner anfänglichen Nervosität es fiel mir auf, dass ich sie nicht begrüßt habe. Das wollte ich in aller Form mich gerade nochmal nachholen, <lacht> weil ich dann sofort in das Gespräch mit I was not very polite in the beginning and so I have to correct myself a little bit. Oh, okay. yeah. but, but now I want to bring you back to the question of uh, cultural differences because you have made this kind of experiences. And in, uh, in the time of globalization, a lot of people are speaking about the global language of art. What do you think about this ah. term of global art? Well, um, again, we have to be very, very careful. Um, who is speaking and to whom? Um, if it's a poet or an artist or a musician speaking about the global language, it's one thing. If it's a museum director or an art dealer, It's another thing. What they really mean is the global market. In other words, that uh, because of the communications which are with internet and, uh, and everything else, that an artist can be uh, uh, immediately discovered by an art dealer in Peking or in Cape Town or in Moscow or in, or in Dusseldorf and become a market star uh, next week all over the world. That's what they mean by globalization. In other words, there's the, uh, you know, the Basel Art Fair is the most global thing that exists. And now they have the Basel Art Fair in Miami and, and, and you have the art fair in Cologne and, and et cetera, et cetera. That's what they mean by globalization. In other words, that uh, the The market is dominated by a few artists who are imposed by the dealers as being the only legitimate artists of that time, which is, of course, a total scandal. Uh, for instance, now at the Saint Pompidou in Paris, uh, there's an enormous uh, Jeff Koontz exhibition. And, and uh, uh, you know, there's th this enormous machinery of public relations uh, that imposes uh, Jeff Koontz, who, as you probably know, before he was an artist, he was a Wall Street trader, you know? And he has kept that same mentality now, you know? He's just changed his activity, but the mentality is the same. It's Wall Street manipulation. And um, in that sense, I am in absolute resistance against that uh, process of globalization. I would rather we discuss, if you agree, another kind of, of globalization, which is not globalization at all, in fact. It's just a simple exchange between creative processes. That's why I brought this up with the Calabri scheme, because there are definitely techniques of resistance that artists and non-artists can, can have at their disposition today. And collective uh, creativity is one of the main uh, uh, tools of resistance that we have. If you want other examples, I have them. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> but, but let us speak a little bit uh excuse me, more deep about uh, cultural differences. Yeah. You told him, you mentioned the beginning about the black culture was very important for you yeah. as a child and yeah. later too. And it was because you realize that the black culture is different from a white culture. And now there are a lot of people who are speaking about globalization in, this, in the way that we are saying, because the world is so small now, we have internet and we have information about every other culture, the cultures are coming together to one global culture or to one global language. Um, I don't know, Norbert. You say that we all have, we have the information. No, we don't have the information. We have very superficial um, data, you know, where the person is born, what he or she, she is doing, and especially how much it's worth on the market. That's not information. That's propaganda. Uh, 
you know, uh, in, uh, Internet or Google is, is 50% of the in so-called information on Google is completely wrong. Look up your name on Google and you'll see what they say about you. It's all bullshit, you know? And so that's not information. Um, th they try and brainwash you into thinking that you have all the information that you need, but you don't. You need, you have to get your own information, you have to create it, you have to work for it. And um, first of all, I don't think that art is really about information. I think it's about uh, experience, and um, it's about cultural differences. Let's go back to that. Um, we we are under impression if we go to school, if we go to the university, in whatever country, in whatever language, um, in totalitarian regimes or in so-called so-called democratic regimes, you go to school and go to university and you are told that there's only one type of legitimate culture, the one that you're being taught. Of course that's not true. Um, there are many ways to paint, many ways to dance, many ways to speak, many ways to dream, many ways to write, and that um, um, I don't think there is such a thing as white culture or black culture. It's much more complicated than that. There are many different white cultures. There are many different black cultures. I mean, the, uh, uh, a black African culture from South Africa is not at all the same thing as the Martinican or Guadalupan cultures. Although you would say that the Caribbean culture, which is something that I know uh, a little about because I have many Caribbean friends, poets and artists and, and political activists, they call they come from slavery, all of them. But it's not at all the same thing as even though their the color of their skin resembles a lot of, of, of Africans, it's a completely different cup cup of tea. It, you, it, and they refuse to be uh, assimilated w one f with the other, you see. So it's it, actually, we're talking about individuals, perhaps, you know, not global, massive, industrially produced concepts of culture. We're talking about something which is comes from the subconscious. So is we all have a subconscious, all of us. Uh, we, there's something called collective consciousness and individual subconsciousness. Um, how these things work together to produce a human being which is different from others is something that's very difficult to explain in a few words, but I think that art has a lot to do with it. Um, put it this way, I would almost suggest that for an artist to be a really free human being, in other words, somebody who is fighting for one's freedom, because of course freedom doesn't exist, you have to create it, um, I don't see how you can do that without revolting against the dominant culture. Whatever the dominant culture is in which you live, whether it's Africa or America or Asia or whatever, there's always a dominant culture. You know, for instance, you, you spend a lot of time in China. Uh, you know very well that uh, the Chinese regime today, apart from being one of the most imperialist and, and monstrously military uh, uh, I I imperialists uh, concerning Tibet, for instance, uh, uh, has given a lot of freedom, uh, a lot of uh, relative freedom to artists. Artists can paint. They can show their work. They can make a lot of money in China. Huh? But uh, that's not true for people who work in factories. If you try and organize a strike in a factory, you are immediately arrested. Uh, 
You don't have the, the freedom is only for, for people who are making a lot of money in the art world, not for the people in the factories. You know, when they get together, the people who make the shoes that we buy for cheap uh, in China or, or the, uh, the things in our computers, and they're, they're paid very little amount of money. And when they organize a strike, immediately the police comes and arrests them. So there is no freedom of expression outside of the art world. So I don't see how a human being in any given situation can um, try and reconstruct his or her life and re-sculpt who they are, who they want to be, who they want to become without revolting against that uh, uh, That that dominant culture, wherever it is. So in that sense, you might say that there's something global about that, perhaps. Although the situation is completely different in Moscow than in Peking, than in Dusseldorf, than in Paris, there is, you're always up against um, something that is oppressive. And that is the problem of, of language that you have to adopt in your work. I would like to is speak. Is that clear? Yeah, uh, but I would like to speak a little bit more about cultural differences, okay. um, because you mentioned what you believe in the cultural differences, but your idea of it it's because of your experience perhaps different, and I, I w would come back to the old nice black woman, and you were confronted as a child, mm -hmm. directly with another culture. Yeah. Do you think that with was an influence on your thinking about cultural differences and in, in, in which way it was you, you have found to another f kind of thinking and watching because of your experience with other cultures, not only with this black woman because uh, you, uh, you told me uh, too about uh, Jonas Mekas, for example, he uh, was coming from uh, uh, Poland. Lithuania. Uh, no, no uh, um, Jonas uh, Mikas. Yeah, from yeah. Lithuania. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. And c can you speak a little bit more about your first experience with other cultures and about perhaps the surprise on your side about it? Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult question because. Um, I don't like talking about myself too much, but anyway, but anyway, um, it's it's uh, when you're a child, you tend, I suppose, to consider that reality is defined by your immediate environment. In other words, your family, your family environment. Okay. Uh, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche that you are told to respect in school and everywhere that uh, you have to conform to a certain number of rules, certain codes of behavior, certain codes of language, etc. And that is reality. And so it's very possible and very often the fact that you get caught in a prison system you are imprisoned in that small definition of reality, which is that of the child and his or her environment. So in de you, you're perfectly right. It was an enormous shock for me to be all of a sudden as a little so-called white, although I'm not really very white uh, kid, brought to Harlem in a holy roller church that's what they call a holy roller church uh on sunday morning where uh, black ladies were going into trances and 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 speaking in tongues by the way uh speaking in tongues in other words they're not speaking in english or french or german they're speaking in the you know uh, uh invented language, a bit like Antonin Artaud's invented language, or, or, or sound poetry, what we call sound poetry today, which is not words with grammar, but inventing new, uh, new languages. And it's the language of trance. And so 
of course, I was completely shocked into realizing that there were other uses of language. That language is not only two and two equals four, or this is hot, this is cold, and all the stuff that you're told when you're a little kid. But there are other things that escape, escape grammar, that escape logic, that escape the rationality of, of, of the capitalist society, and that brings you to another completely different way of feeling what is real and what is not real. And it took me all my life to try and understand that experience. I'm still thinking about it now. And I think that one of the reasons why I try and do art is because I was trying to figure that out still now, you see. So it's, it's much more than just cultural differences. It's, um, how would you say, it's a lesson that in order to survive in this society, whether it's Dusseldorf or New York, it doesn't really matter, you have to have at least two existences. One which is the legal existence, that you have to get a job, you have to eat, you know, you have to manage somehow to survive economically and socially. But then you have a, you are in danger of becoming a real slave, a real bureaucrat of your own slavery, without knowing it, of course, without realizing it. So that's where it's very necessary, absolutely necessary, to have another life which is your own, the one that corresponds to your subconscious desires, whatever it is, whatever they are. And it's the play between these two realities. This, you might call it the schizophrenic conflict between these two realities. You could call it that if you want. Uh, that produces who you are. Your personality is not one or the other. It's the conflict, the creative conflict between the two. And it's a relative process that you might uh, develop into a creative process. That's why it's so important to understand that the, uh, the great surrealist invention of the jeu de cadavreski, <laughs> the game of the cadavreski, allowed that to be expressed. Whereas before, you know, it was not allowed. You're supposed to paint a landscape. You're supposed to paint a Madonna. You're supposed to paint flowers in a vase or whatever you're supposed to paint. But you're not supposed to paint some things that have no name and that are in your dreams. So it's more than just cultural differences. It's the difference of perception of what reality is all about. Okay? Yeah, I think so. You have spoken about schizophrenia, and you have spoken about what we have not identity who is fixed, but in every one of us is more than one a person. And do, do, do you believe, because you are grown up, for example, with this black, it's for me only a metaphor, with this black woman, do you think what you took something from another culture in yourself so that you create or your unconsciousness create a kind of black and white personality in yourself? Uh, yeah, I, of course. I wouldn't call it a personality. I would call it a process. But definitely, of course, yes. Um, the, 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 the awareness that um, there is another world that there are many other worlds. That it's, you know, uh, uh, I'll give you an, a counter example. Um, there was a book that came out in the 50s uh, written by an American sociologist. It was called The Ugly American. Maybe you've read it or heard about it. And it was um, a, a very interesting critique of the American tourist who goes around the world with money and a camera and short pants and a hat and goes to China or goes to Africa or goes to Europe and speaks to everybody in English as if everybody was supposed to understand English. That's why I, I started out this little talk by saying, please forgive me for not speaking your language because I really don't want to be associated with that kind of thing. 
um, but now, especially now that English has become the global language, uh, that, that you know, that every you go anywhere in the world and you have to speak English because that's the only language that people speak. Really, they don't have their own language anymore. A lot of times, so um, in that book, it said it was the caricature of the ugly American who arrives in Rome and first of all goes to an Italian restaurant and says I want a hamburger or what in Italy in those days in the 50s they didn't have hamburgers you know they didn't know what a hamburger was you know and then the same guy goes to Moscow or something and says I want a hamburger but you know what do you mean hamburger or you go to Cuba want a hamburger everywhere you know what I mean and that's that's disgusting because that means that that person feels that the entire world is the same as his world. It's, that's the only legal possible world is his little American world with hamburgers and ketchup and, and all that, you know? Realizing that the food is different, the language is different, the air is different, the cities are different, the country is different, everything's different, but he doesn't see it. He thinks that the world is the same. It's a uniform, unified place, which is a total mistake, of course. So that's what I think that globalization is. That's, that's what's occurring with, with the globalization of the art market, the globalization of Google, of internet, and, and it's a terribly dangerous type of uniformization of all human endeavors and human activity. And um, I really cannot stress enough the fact that f for, for my own feeling, um, the, the minimum that we can do, the, the minimum that we have to do to, to uh, have access to our own humanity is to revolt against that. That's one thing that uh, I'd like to stress that here, um, about, I think it was about 10 years ago, at the Museum Kunstpalast, when Jean Hubert was director, I was invited to, um, to curate a show on Anton Artaud, which I think you saw. And uh, I know Marie-Louise saw it, and, 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 and Conrad saw it, and maybe quite a few of you saw that show. It was a very important show for me because it was, uh, you know, Artaud is the, how would you say, the perfect example of the schizophrenic genius, visionary genius. Not only because he reinvented contemporary theater, not only because he had reinvented graphic drawing, but he also invented new languages, different languages, which didn't come from uh, the dictionary or you know the, the grammar. He invented new ways of speaking. And it seemed to me very important that in a, uh, a museum such as that one in Dusseldorf, with Dusseldorf being the hub of so many artistic activities in, in Germany and in Europe, um, that Artaud would be considered as a laboratory of possibilities that had not been accepted by the mainstream cultures. And that um, I would say that um, you're talking about cultural differences. I, I don't see a possibility to exist without reinventing one's, one's own codes of behavior, one's own culture, one's own set of values. Uh, does that make sense to you? Oh. Uh, but we, because we have started to speak about different languages, yeah. and you are speaking different languages, yeah. and uh, in one uh, time when, when we have spoken a little bit about it, you mentioned uh, uh, Roman Jakobsen yeah. and his theory about uh, of languages. Yeah. What happens in the moment when you use the English language, like now, 
when you switch to f uh, French languages, what happens? Ah. What kind of changement okay. uh, is created by the change okay. of language? Uh, that's a very delicate question. Um, Let me give you the example of Kafka, which is somebody I admire very, very much. Kafka had three, used three languages every day in his mind and in his work. The, um, he, he worked, as you know, in Prague in an insurance company at the Assicurazione Generale, and it, he used the Czech language uh, in his everyday working uh, job. He also read Hebrew, his religious stuff. But when he wrote his novels and his journals, he wrote in German. So that means that Franz Kafka had three, there was at least three different Franz Kafkas. Maybe there were more than three, but at least three, okay? Because each language had its purpose. He would not write his novels in Hebrew. He would not pray in German, if he prayed. Uh, anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, Another example is Jack Kerouac. Jack Kerouac was somebody who was very close to my heart and whom I translated and whom I knew. And as you probably know, Jack Kerouac was what you call a French Canadian. What that, quote unquote, meaning that uh, he came from Quebec. Quebec, as you know, was a French colony um, many centuries ago and it has kept a certain old-style French language as the everyday language in Quebec. It's not English. They speak English, too, of course, but their language is 17th century French. And it's very difficult to understand because of the tonality and the, and the vocabulary, but it's definitely old French. And where Jack Kerouac was born in Lowell, Massachusetts, on the New England, and um, is uh, he f came from a French Canadian family? They spoke only French Canadian in the family, and his mother, who's uh, he called Memer, um, was a very bigoted Catholic racist woman. She hated blacks and Jews, and she was very Catholic. And she went to to mass almost every day, and she tried to bring up Jack Kerouac that way. And Jack Kerouac, maybe you don't know that, that the first version of his famous book, On the Road, his famous novel that made him famous all over the world, was written in French. The first synopsis was written in French. And all of a sudden, he realized that he, his mother could read it because she, she wrote and spoke only French. She was living in Lowell, Massachusetts all her life, but she couldn't speak more than three or four words in English. She, she had a block. She couldn't, she couldn't read or, or write in English. So he, he figured it out that if he wanted to write things about his life, about how he loved jazz, how he was always interested in ladies, how he was like drinking and smoking pot and all that. He had to write it in another language because otherwise his mother would read it and it would be terrible. So he started writing in English. You see? So there's a cultural difference for you, my dear friend. So that in order to free himself from the family domination and the ideology of the old Catholic bullshit, he had to change languages and go into another language. And that's how he became the great Jack Kerouac, you see? And so I can give you many other examples like that. Uh, Samuel Beckett, for instance, who was, as you know, Irish, he was born Irish, and he had been James Joyce's secretary when he was uh, young. He came to live in France, and he wrote most of his most important books in French. 
where he lived all his life in Paris, and then translated one or two into English. So what I'm trying to say is that passing from one language to another, shifting from one to another, is a way of freeing oneself from the constraints and the, the rules of, 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 of the castrating cultural system. And it's something that probably each one of you experience all the time, you know? That's the, w that's the way we survive, using techniques like that. <coughs> okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm answering his questions or not. I'm doing my best, you know. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so it means you don't believe with the, 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 the term of the global language of art. It means, no, yeah. let me talk. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> it, it means, but if I see an artwork from a Chinese artist or from India, it means I can and understand it because the global language is the same. But you don't believe in the global, in the, this kind of utopia of a global uh, language of art. What does it mean mm. if you are confronted with an art piece of an artist from India? We will realize that we cannot understand everything. But what does it mean for us to have a look on it? What does it mean? Well, I don't know. For each one of us, it's different. But uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I wonder about that very often when I go to Italy. And I spend a lot of time in churches and museums, like all of you, when I go to Italy. And I rem last time I was in Venice with some friends, we went into the church of the Gesuati um, in, in, um, in Venice. And there's this famous painting by Titian, which is an absolute masterpiece. You have uh, San Lorenzo who on, on a grill, on a fire, like a hamburger, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he's, he's burning, you know? He's been punished. Uh, uh, he's, he's a martyr of the, of the Catholic Church. Um, and he's burning. And uh, uh, the people who the tourists who come into the church, they have no idea about what that painting is about. And they have no idea who San Lorenzo is and why his body is red and being burnt like a hamburger, you know? And uh, um, so what do they get from that painting? What do they get from that painting? Do they, do they perceive something of what Titian was trying to convey or do they see and perceive something completely different which has nothing to do with the biblical mythological story and does it next question does it matter is it important that they understand what the saint so-called saint is doing there why he's being punished why why is this important in a ch Catholic church? Why is this uh, martyrdom so fundamental to the religion? I don't know. Another question. Billie Holiday. For me, Billie Holiday is probably one of the... There is an influence. I really... I cannot s really spend three or four days of my life without listening to Billie Holiday's voice. For me, she is probably one of the most sublime incarnations of art. And as you probably know, she sang in a very black American idiom. Sometimes you understand the words, sometimes you don't. What's important is the tonality, is the magic of her, of her, Extraordinary, it's like Callas, you know. You don't, you can, you maybe don't understand Italian, but when Callas sings uh, an aria by Bellini, you're moved to tears, you know, even if you don't understand the words. So there's an answer to your question. If you are a Japanese person, and I know that in Japan they listen to a lot of jazz, and they put on a, a record or a recording of Billie Holiday, e even Americans have a great difficulty to understand the words of Bill Holiday because she uses language in a very extraordinary, complex, poetic way. 
they maybe don't get the exact words, but they are moved by the voice. So maybe that's a good answer to your question. Is there something global in art? I'm not, I don't know, I'm asking the question. That could be perceived by everybody, even if you don't have the key to what the so-called logical meaning is. Maybe there's something else that's being played, that's being said, that's being experienced, that has nothing to do with a message. And maybe in that case, you're right, there might be something called global art, or globally efficient art. But it has nothing to do with the dominance of one culture by another culture. It has to do with the, the absolute magic of what uh, painting or music is about. It's, it's, it's disconnected from the market, in other words. Okay? No. <laughs> Let us speak. Uh, for, 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 for me, the, the, the most important, for, for example, very often uh, there was a show in the National Gallery in Berlin, a Chinese artist who is making always white paintings, and if you are long, if you are looking longer and longer on it, you see slowly a landscape. And in the catalogue, someone, an art historian has written about this Chinese artist, and he was comparing it with C. Tomley, because C. Tomley was working with white color too. And when I realized, because I knew this artist and have made some long interviews with him, and I realized that this kind of comparing something with a Western artist, it's, really it's a kind of colonialism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But this means in which way we have to think about the conversation between cultural differences. And perhaps it is helpful to take one word of Deleuze, osmose, in order to speak in your way about the conversation between different cultures. What happens in the moment when you are in front or uh, on the side of a black woman and you realize that she has another culture, and what happens in the moment when you come together with... Well, um, put it this way, I think that what you're alluding to is not osmos, it's kaosmos. Yeah, kaosmos. Kaosmos, it's very important. Uh, by the way, it's Guattari, it's, it's not Deleuze, but it doesn't matter. Um, it's, a, it's a play on words, it's a pun that Felix invented. Chaos and osmosis. And he invented kaosmos. In other words, I'm interpreting um, you might agree or disagree, I don't know, that if you reduce the Chinese painters into trying to compare it to Sai Twombly's work, which is obviously something completely different, you're completely neglecting or not perceiving the originality of the Chinese artist. You're not seeing it. You're trying to compare it to something that you already know. You're diminishing it. You're s making it smaller and smaller to fit in the category of logic that you already know about. In other words, you're destroying its originality. You are denying its originality. That's what that critic was doing, right? So the only answer to that would be to try and forget about your sets of values, to, to try and forget your codes of interpretation, and to enter into some sort of, I wouldn't almost use, it's exaggerated to use the word trance, but into a non-rational relationship with that object of your, perception, to try and figure out a way of exchange with the object of your contemplation without reducing it to something that you already know. 
and to allow yourself to travel outside of yourself, that's where the concept of chaos moves is important, to allow chaos to enter your life, to enter your mind, and to not try and rationalize everything into uh, organized uh, boxes. And that way, perhaps you might see the, the landscape in the white sky or the white space. Because if you're looking at the Chinese artist in the way that you think you should be looking at a Cy Twombly painting, you're in trouble. <laughs> it means you don't see Twombly and you don't see the Chinese artist. You don't see anything. You just see cliches in your mind, you know? You don't see the object. You see uh, a projected uh, cinema Google in your head that, uh, it, that's a, like a wall and you, and you can't go through that wall to see what you're supposed to be looking at. You know, if you listen to um, Billie Holiday thinking that you're listening to Wagner, you're in trouble because you can't listen to Billie Holiday with the ears of, of Wagner and you can't listen to Wagner with the ears of Billie Holiday. Each time you have to adapt to uh, the precise magical logic of what you're trying to perceive. And it's a big, terrible job. I understand that. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. But that's the joy of being alive, you know. It's not uh, swallowing uh, fast food, but uh, trying to, every morning, every day, to try and uh, to change their, your perception system. It's a lot of work. Uh, in because the, the problem is it's very complex. For, for example, you, you have said in the beginning that there is not only one Chinese culture, there are a lot of, perhaps million and more different cult, uh, Chinese culture or German cultures. Mm. B because it's created too by uh, subjectivity of the people. But we can't say always perhaps there is a Chinese culture or there are different Chinese cultures, and there are different French cultures. But the, the basic of everything is that the human beings were always nomadic. So what every culture is influenced by another one, but there is a point where it's something created as a Chinese culture or as a French culture. You have an idea in which way we can explain it? Well, I, I, uh, Norbert, I, I question the existence of, the very existence of that thing that you call French culture. It, it's, it's a meaningless, empty concept. I mean, look at China, okay? Uh, China, you have Confucianism, you have Taoism, you have Buddhism. Those are at least three completely different uh, Weltanschauung, huh? completely different. The, 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 the Confucian concept of the organized hierarchical, hierarchical pyramidal society is completely impossible to, 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 um, to put on the same level as the Taoist uh, 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 vision of the world uh, that, say, Chuang Tzu or Li Tzu uh, uh, develop in their writings. So they, everybody calls that Chinese culture, but it's, it's, it's absurd. There is no such thing. There are many Chinese cultures. There's not one, and, and you know that. You know, we, we know that, you know? Um, uh, we, we have so many examples of that. So what we're trying to say is that when you are in front of a painting or you're reading a book, you should try and enter the specific pro thinking process uh, that you're faced with and not try and placate your own interpretation system on it because otherwise you're in the danger of not seeing anything except uh, the delusion of what you think you're seeing. And that's, that's typical of, uh, I would say, uh, a very academic um, 
way of, 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 of interpreting the world that we have in universities. It's a dangerous, dangerous way of, of trying to reduce the many aspects, the many possibilities of human culture or cultures into one centralized global way which is uh, of course completely uh, impossible to 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 uh, to, uh, to it doesn't exist it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's an ideological construct right uh, i understand more and more your thinking i, I think so Never you would use a term like there is a cultural identity. No. But in which way, but America is America and not China. In which way you would speak about what there are something different? Well, uh, if I knew the answer to that, uh, I wouldn't need to paint anymore. I, I think I'm continuing to paint and make my installations and my drawings and my work to try and answer that question. But I, I don't think there is a fixed, uh, obvious answer to that. I don't believe in, uh, in you know, uh, formulaic uh, answers. I don't believe in the, the, the Google fast food answer to complex questions. I mean, that question that you ask is so complex that I, I really don't think that there is such a thing as one good answer. Uh, I think there's a process and we're, we're forever running after uh, something that we think might become the truth, but I'm not even sure the truth exists. I don't even believe that there's such a thing as Santa Claus, you know, on Christmas Day. When you're a little kid, you think, ah, Santa Claus exists. Well, uh, uh, maybe I'll get some candies or some shoes or something. And yeah, that's the position that we are made to believe that culture is about, you know? Santa Claus, we're told that uh, it's, I don't believe in that. I think it's a complete, it's a complete uh, fallacy, the whole thing. So it makes it so difficult to use the concept of culture, you know, even. The, what do we mean by the word culture? Maybe when you use the word and I use the word, we're meaning two different, com completely different things. Uh, uh, do we use it the way Lévi-Strauss would use it as a, as a, as a uh, anthropological concept of, you know, uh, a set of rules, a set of li linguistic rules, uh, a set of moral attitudes, or uh, or do we see it as what we call mass culture, like television, or or or, or, or you know what I mean? We we have to define every word that we use completely, and precisely to understand what we're trying to say to each other, and it's a very difficult job. <laughs> <laughs> it's exhausting, matter of fact. Let us try to think a little bit about it. Can we <coughs> look at some images? Mm, yeah. Or not? Can we? But, but perhaps you, uh, in this way, you have worked very often in collectives yeah. for temporary, uh, for yeah. example, with Arrow, yeah, an yeah. artist who is living, a, uh, who is one of your closest friends. Yeah. Uh, and can you speak about your work as an artist in collectives? Yeah. I in relationship to yeah. the question of globalization? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that, that's what I was trying to, to, to articulate, is that... Um, Already the idea of the author, of the person who signs the painting, the person who signs the drawing, who signs the installation, uh, if you are in a situation where it's a collective that is doing the work, it, ch it changes everything. Um, could, could you, could you um, help me uh, show the f one, two, three, four, yeah, yeah. Th here's this is uh, uh, this is a collage, um, surrealist Kalavrikski collage. Um, this is how they proceeded. Uh, 
André Breton and his wife and Yves Tanguy and his wife went on a holiday somewhere and they cut out a lot of these images with scissors and they put on the table a lot of images, these little images. And after one or two days of that, very automatically, very quickly, they constructed these things, these, these images. Now, maybe I should tell you that a cadaver ski is done in a very special way. The first person does the top part, you see? And then it's fold, the paper is folded. And the next person doesn't see what the preceding person did. And it continues. Then it's hidden, it's hidden, and it's folded. And at the end, they unfold the paper, and all of a sudden you see what happened. So it's a completely new way of producing images. Let's see the next one. Bitte schön. There's another one. You see? There is no logical determination th that composes this imagery. It is done by a blind way. In other words, it's the collective subconscious of the people, the four people who are doing it, that it produces this, okay? And so this is something that's very important because it changes the whole outlook of what art is supposed to be. C could you please, bitte schön? Now, that's a very interesting one uh, because it was done in 1927 and the top part is by Max Ernst. And I was telling you before that I, one of the first times I came to Dusseldorf, I think it was about 25 years ago, was to see the wonderful Max Ernst show at the Nordrhein Westfalen Museum that Werner Spies had organized, which was Max Ernst's um, uh, graphic works, collages and drawings. It was really wonderful. So there you see, there you, you see the folded paper. You can see the folding of the paper, the head, and there it's folded, and then it continues. And the bottom part is André Masson. And so it's a game. It's a new way of allowing yourself to play with the images and not to try and copy some kind of postcard that you have in your head, in, as you're taught in many academic ways of doing art, it's a completely new way of doing things. The next one, Bita Shen. This is to answer your question. Uh, this is 1960. We are in Milano, and the two guys on the ladders in the back, the one on the top is Ero, he's an Icelandic artist, he's my best friend. We've been friends since the uh, we were 16 years old, and um, the guy with the white shirt is me. And we are painting an enormous canvas called the Grand Tableau Antifasciste Collectif, which is Maria Luisa, who is here now. She is the first one who, in, um, in Germany, uh, wrote about this work uh, in, in Kunstforum uh, many years ago. I think it was at least 30 years ago, wasn't it? Huh? That was a long time ago. Anyway, I never forgot it. And uh, this is the 1961 exhibition in Milano called the Anti Procès. And in the foreground, there's a sculpture by uh, Lucio Fontana. So why am I showing this to you? Because the enormous painting in the background, um, can you show the next one, Bitte schön? Thank you. There it is. Uh, it was painted by six of us, and it was during the Algerian War. The Algerian War was a very, very traumatic, horrible uh, um, experience for us. Um, it w the um, French army was behaving like Nazis in France and in Algeria, torturing political prisoners. It was a horrible thing, and uh, it was actually... Uh, 
that, that's why we painted this picture to protest against that. And um, the uh, women in the Algerian uh, FLN were being raped by soldiers. Uh, they, 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 they were tortured to death. It was a horrible thing. So six of us, uh, three Italians, one, uh, four Italians, one Icelandic, and one French guy got together to paint this picture, and it's called Grand Tableau Antifascist Collectif. Why antifascist? Because it occurred to us that a society, whatever the society is, that it accepts as legal and okay the fact that you torture other people that are political prisoners. You can imagine what's going on today, now, in Baghdad and in, and in Afghanistan and, and all over the place. Uh, then this was Algeria and France, but now it's gotten much worse today. We put, painted this picture together, six of us, to, as an act of resistance, uh, of refusal of the civilization which produces this. And uh, the painting was seized by the police in Milano for 24 years, and then it was given back to us, and now it's been exhibited all around Europe. And it, at the, it was shown at the Musée du Louvre recently, and is now in uh, is now in um, the Musée des Beaux Arts de Nantes in, in, in France. I'm showing this to you because I think it's important. As we talk about this often with Norbert, that um, there are ways of resisting. There are ways of being completely yourself. In other words, you are more free to be who you want to be when you are in a collective. That sounds like a paradox, but in fact it's not a paradox. Going back to what Ornette Coleman was saying in the Free Jazz record, it's, you are more free when you are doing a cadavreski or when you are playing free jazz than when you are alone with yourself in your own studio. Why is that? Because there is a relationship that is a process of exchange with other human beings that allows you to free your creative energies. And so it's not such a paradox after all. Um, yeah, that, that happens to be uh, a, a political manifesto which was signed by uh, André Breton and Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir and, and um, hundreds and hundreds of intellectuals, uh, uh, musicians, painters, uh, writers, philosophers against the Algerian war saying uh, that um, in a situation of imperialism and horror such as war, uh, it is the right of the citizen to desert, to, to refuse to go into the army. And um, uh, that manifesto was pasted into the big painting, which I just showed to you. So in other words, um, there was a way of saying no to the horror, okay? That's what I'm trying to say, that even today, even with the Google civilization and, and, the, and the torturing that's going on today all over the place, and the horrors of these uh, fundamentalist religious wars and, and, uh, and what's going on all over the world, there are ways of saying no. There are ways of not becoming a monster. It's very, very difficult and it's very exhausting, but I don't think we should give up. I, you, should, you want to stop? No. <laughs> Aren't you getting bored? Uh, no, I, w I would. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but okay. uh, uh, but no, 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 no. Go ahead. No, because of the time is uh, almost over. Okay, we'll go ahead. Uh, no, we have to sit here longer uh, <laughs> for questions. <laughs> so so uh, I have a lot of questions, but uh, I ahead, want to stop now with my questions. And uh, I would say it's not. He is not coming very often to Düsseldorf, only sometimes. And I give up to you. What kind of question do you have? And I hope you have a lot. So, what he has to sit longer here. Does anybody have a question? Yes. Go ahead. <coughs> Does it still happen to you to make collective things or not? Pardon? Uh, does it 
still happen to you? To me? A collective thing. Oh, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Do you? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I don't know if I have a picture of one here. Yes, Maria Luisa, yes. Um, absolutely. Uh, I do all the time. Um, as often as possible. Uh, with my close friends, like Aero, for instance, uh, and the Zetkayim in, in Karlsruhe, um, uh, Peter Weibel showed quite a few of these more or less recent works that I did with certain friends. Um, but to answer your question, um, I think it was eight years ago, Aero and I, we went to Cambodia because believe it or not, I had never seen the Angkor Wat temples. And I felt like an idiot, you know, because it's it's so so important to understand that extraordinary, f historically important uh, vision that the uh, Cambodian uh, uh, created in the ninth and 10th centuries. In other words, more than a thousand years ago. And we finally got on a plane, went to Bangkok, took the train, and we went to see that. And um, it was a sh tremendous cultural shock for me, uh, uh, at least as important as seeing the pyramids in, in e Egypt. It was a really a very deep shock. Because first of all, I don't know if you've been there, but if you, s first of all, there are 23 temples, not only one you know, uh, and they're all different. And each temple is built like a mandala. In other words, it's square outside, and then in the square, there's a circle, in the circle, there's a square, in the square, there's a circle, and it goes up like that. And you have to travel through all this if you can. And when you get to the top, uh, you have to struggle to get there. Uh, and it's a really extraordinary experience. But, on the ground floor, on the square, you have uh, sc sculpted frescoes that date back at least a thousand years. And there, we realized something that I had not realized by just reading the books and looking at the photos, is that the entire history of the Cambodian peoples, plural, was sculpted in stone. And you had the struggles of, that have been going on for many, many centuries between the Buddhists and the Islamists, between the Hinduists and the others. And they're all massacre, and they're always killing, and there's death all over the place. And it was really battles and battles and battles and battles. A bit like, uh, if you will, the Mahabharata mythology in, in India, but different, of course. And it occurred to me that this massacre business has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And it's nothing new. You know, the Cambodian people have been suffering from invasion and imperialism and destruction. And, it, and they made it into art. And when we were there, we were talking with some Cambodians, of course. And I asked them questions about this Pol Pot business. You perhaps remember, I hope you do, that there was a, a horrible Marxist-Leninist, quote unquote, Marxist-Leninist regime called the Khmer Rouge that uh, uh, perpetrated genocide in Cambodia uh, and uh, uh, actually were responsible for the death of almost two million people. It was a small population of only six million people. And they killed them and massacred them for political reasons. And um, we went to see the mausoleums of the, 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 the skulls and the bones in which these uh, victims have been organized in Phnom Penh. They are uh, sort of like reliquaries with thousands and thousands and thousands of skulls and bones of human beings that were massacred by the Khmer Rouge. 
And Ero and I, we were completely, you know, destroyed by the vision of what we were confronted with, you know? We hadn't realized, even though we had read the books and, 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 and the articles, it's something else when you're confronted physically with that horror. And we were really, really very upset by that. And um, when we came back on the airplane, we decided that we would do another painting together. And um, we did it. Uh, and uh, we invited uh, two other artists, uh, Camilla Adami, who is an Italian art, uh, painter. She lives in, in Paris and in Italy. And uh, Peter Saul, the American artist, and Arrow, who's still Icelandic, and myself, supposedly French, more or less French. And we, we did a, another painting like that. And so that's to answer your question. Uh, it was a completely spontaneous thing. We, we weren't thinking really. Uh, we just needed to do it, you know? So it, we do it, yeah, quite often. Eine andere Frage? something about of course the present situation in Paris right now yeah you have a fight going on and I don't think so a lot of people are realizing that it's the question of where is the demarcation line between the Centre Pompidou and the Musée du Quai Branly and in my opinion we also have a fight there between academies One is the Academy of Modernism, European Western Modernism, and the other fight is about anthropology uh, and people who are anthropologists who are in fact protecting their own grounds, hunting grounds, I would say. Mm -hmm. And there are difficult problems, I guess, how the people at the Centre Pompidou, who run the Centre Pompidou, that means Western modernism. And uh, the other people at the Quai Branly, who is an institution of, I would say, in, in fact, both institutions are built on separation. Do you have, uh, did you observe that fight that is going on in Paris right now? which uh -huh. actually began, began with Marchi saint -Alatère. Yeah, it's a, it's a terrible situation. I th you, uh, it, it, it's not the only one. There are many. This, this situation which you describe is reproduced in many other instances. Um, it's, it, there's so many different layers in that cake. Um, in France, there's a national sickness, illness, which is that um, presidents and politicians, they use cultural institutions as mausoleums to themselves. You know, like uh, Lenin mausoleum in the Red Square in Moscow. But, uh, it, but here, it's Pompidou who constructed his own mausoleum with the Saint Pompidou. And, um, and, Chirac, so and Chirac, Chirac wanted one of his, for himself, and he constructed the Quai Branly one. It's, and uh, Mitterrand did the same with that horrible Bibliothèque uh, Mitterrand. So it's, it, it's horrible because they are using these collect, uh, public money and, and, and very important uh, resources as uh, political propaganda tools. That's one level. It's a, a very mediocre level. On the other levels, uh, continuing to try and answer your question, you have conflicting bureaucracies, machinery, you know, the machinerie bureaucratique, as uh, uh, Guattari would say, um, which they're always trying to eat the other one, to eat the neighbor, you know? Like you have a, a cage where the lion is trying to eat the tiger and the tiger is trying to eat the lion and they're fighting over the money. And now, of course, with the 
terrible economic crisis that we have in France and here and everywhere in the world, there's much less money than there was before. So they're struggling even more to get the money to do what they want to do. And um, you have these ego problems between the directors. Um, you might say that it's absurd and ridiculous because they are both come from the right-wing French politics, but they're still fighting amongst each other. And um, actually, there's something, th this is my own feeling, maybe you would agree or not, I don't know, that they both are using the pretext of avant-garde architecture to advance their ideology. Yeah, as you know, the Pompidou Center was created by Renzo Piano, and uh, was, by the way, I don't know if you know it, it was built by Krupp. Did you know that the Centre Pompidou is completely constructed by Krupp? And it's interesting, no? <laughs> Given the history of Europe and what Krupp uh, did in the 30s, it's interesting that th that um, enterprise was given the, the contract to build the Saint Pompidou, which is, by the way, falling apart because uh, it was built so that the walls could move, you know, that they could adapt for the exhibitions, but they never moved. So they, they have never moved. So it was all a fallacy, this blah, blah, blah about movable walls. And then you have Jean Nouvel who was given the contract to build the Quai Branly, who said, well, we want to outdo the avant-gardism of the Saint Pompidou and the other museums by, as you saw it, um, build something that was, they have wonderful, wonderful works in the Quai Branly, but they're very difficult to see because you have this crazy sort of slalom kind of leather walled shit that you have to go along like a bobsleigh in the in the Olympic Games, you know? And you, it's very difficult to get to see anything because you are forced into a way of reacting to the <coughs> environment there. So, what can I say? Um, <coughs> the Musée du de, de Quai Branly is trying to bring contemporary art in there. It has tried several times. Uh, on the other hand, because they realize that they don't want to be caught in the trap of doing only anthropological art. They were trying and create a dialogue between living art and other cultures. Whether they succeed, succeed or not, I'm afraid I, I can't answer that question. You know. If you want to try to show contemporary non-Western art at the Musée Gay Branly, then you are inventing some kind of uh, separation. That means, uh, yeah, it's, I put it straightforward. It's white only, or it's black only. And I think that's not wha what we are all about and what you are talking about. Yeah, it's not about separation. It's about maybe not integration, but acceptance. So uh, I believe contemporary non-European art belongs to the Centre Pompidou and not to the Museum Quai Well, uh, I think you have a good point there. Um, what they are trying to do, I think, is establishing some kind of comparative procedure. And that's very, very dangerous because you cannot compare um, Mondrian and and a, a Tao, uh, a, a, and a Tibetan Tanka uh, Buddhist uh, painting, you know? The Mondrian is Mondrian, and a Tibetan tanka painting is a Tibetan tanka painting. You you can put one next to the other, but what do you what do you get out of that? 
you get you get a, a conflicted version, a conflicted vision. And what they are trying to do is something that they are trying to escape their bureaucratic prison. Now, will they succeed or not? I really doubt it. Did? Now, you when you say that the, the contemporary non Occidental work should be in the Centre Pompidou. It's true, but who makes the policy of the Centre Pompidou? What about the it's artists? It's the art dealers. What the what? art dealers are, are, are directing the Centre Pompidou. It's not the director of the Centre Pompidou who's directing. It's the pressure of the market. But you were so the, you know yeah. that's 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 the horrible situation. But you were talking about the 60s. Yeah. Uh, we have about the same the same age. Yeah. And that was in Paris in the 60s. Yeah. And uh, I observed what happened with uh, between France and Algeria. Yeah. And I've been in 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 Paris around this time. And of course I uh, also am aware of the the 68ers. And what about a young generation, people of our age? And uh, I think we should try to convince a younger generation really to act against that and to unify. You're talking about unification. If you uh, work on a, on a painting together or whatsoever, I think uh, we really should try to unify and we should try to, to um, how should I say, to convince a young generation to stand up about against uh, these bureaucracies and about uh, against ideologies, anthropologist ideologies, uh, art, mm. historical, art historical ideologies. I think it's about time to stand up again. Well, you know, I don't think they need to be convinced. I think they are already convinced. Um, if you look at the uh, um, the many cultural movements that are going on in the French banlieue, outside of the main s of the central cities, I'm sure it's the same here in Germany. It's the same everywhere. They have created different cultures, you know. They have created different languages. Look at the, the, the rap culture, for instance, you know. It has to do with jazz. It has to do with Arabic languages. It has to do with African languages. It's a completely different cup of tea. And it, has, uh, it cannot go into a museum because it's too alive, you know. And what we have here is a situation, talking about the Pompidou and the Quai Branly and other institutions, we have a complete inadequ inadequacy of cultural institutions, be it university or museums, completely inadequate to, uh, 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 to, to represent living cultures, what's going on in, in, in the life of these uh, revolting uh, young youth that you're talking about, which exists. They have their music, they have their poetry, they have their language, they have their dancing, they have their painting, they have their, 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 their visual expressions. They, they, all this exists already, but it is completely left out of the institutions. The institutions are fighting against that. They refuse that. Uh, not only the two that you mentioned, but all the others too. And um, there is a, a complete uh, um, abyss between the reality of these different cultures and uh, the institutions that are trying to, to, to integrate something of that, but they don't understand it. How can they accept it? How can they allow it to exist if they don't even understand why they, these people exist and why they have a different way of seeing the world. It's, it's a terrible, uh, you, you put your finger on something really terrible there. Um, uh, and I don't know what the solution is. I know only that s several times it, we have noticed in the past 50 or 60 years, that there are moments of explosion. 
social, cultural, human, personal explosions. And these explosions, they come from where? They come from the suffering of people who have no voice, no possibility to uh, to be recognized as human uh, beings. And um, so, of course, they revolt against the institutions. They revolt against the school, the university, the museums, and all that business, you know. And uh, and and it's it repeats that that process is repeated every once in a while, you know. Um, I would like to add something on that uh, Centre Pompidou issue because I think it's really a very um, interesting point and we have seen last year a uh, presentation of the collection which was called Modernité Plurielle and this was really an attempt to open the, the, v the only Western-centered view on, on uh, the art and it was really taken from the collection which is so rich and so broad and then a new director came to the museum and he totally cut and destroyed this presentation which was only meant to be shown for a year. So we can see there are attempts, there are a, l a lot of people know that, that this has to change also in the museums of mo modern arts and, and also in the uh, uh, museums like Quai Branly. And yeah, but I think it will, it takes time and it's really a one step before and two back sometimes it seems like that, yeah, <laughs> or three, even three. <laughs> so I, I would say if um, we are really, we had a very, very interesting evening with you, Jean-Jacques Lebel, merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And I would say thank you too. And uh, ich bedanke mich auch bei Ihnen für Ihr yeah. Kommen und wünsche Ihnen einen guten Abend noch. Yeah. Wiedersehen. Thank you.